for the delay in getting started, folks. We're uh, we're being live streamed now, and uh, we're going to get started. Okay, so I hope uh, everyone's been well, uh, and it's um, it's been a while since we've met. So I want us to get our bearings as to where we are in the Kuzari before we start learning the Parshat Shavua. So um, we're gonna spend a little bit of time on the Kuzari today, just in trying to understand a very important principle uh, in theology that has really, really uh, big repercussions as far as a huge divide in Jewish thought between the Rambam and Rebbe Yehuda Halevi something that we may have touched upon before. We touched upon many differences uh, over the years between Rabbi Yehuda HaLevi and the Rambam in just their general approach to Judaism, to the mystical component of Judaism, to the relevance of the, um, of the physical world as it impacts the spiritual realm and so forth. Today, what we want to focus on is the world of ideas and how important it is to identify God in as clear of a way as possible in order for us to be considered to be uh, faithful Jews. Uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of the things that we talk about, when we think about how to approach Hashem, especially as we enter into the high holidays, is what should I be thinking about when I think about God? I stand, I'm standing before this being, this, this uh, this uh, ultimately supreme being, what is supposed to be circulating in my mind? Is it like this, this old guy with a long flowing beard and a white robe on a cloud? That seems to be something that we're, is frowned upon in Judaism. And we're told that that's, that's not acceptable. What, here, let me, just, uh, let me just turn off everybody's uh, volume for just a second. Um, I pressed the wrong button. Here. Let me, I'm going to mute everybody, okay? You can always unmute yourselves later. Okay, where we are is on page 430 in the Kuzari. Um, I'm going to be posting a quote from that paragraph on the screen. So even if you don't have the book, don't, don't worry about it. Um, what I, I do want to point out is that where we find ourselves in this work is at a place where Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, ah, welcome, welcome. Rabbi Yehuda Halevi was discussing this whole concept of different religions not being completely sincere in their expressions of fealty to God, especially when compared to the Jewish faith. This is sort of a polemic that Rabbi Yehuda Halevi was involved with about talking about, uh, let's say, uh, his, his critique of Christianity and Islam, that despite their monotheistic um, uh, focus, despite their professed dedication to the one God, the same God as the God of Israel, nonetheless, they fall short in certain areas. And one of the areas where they fall short is this idea of focusing on the Holy Land which was a very interesting discussion that we had uh, before we took a break, which is that there's a lot of lip service paid to the Holy Land. And yet the main foci of Christianity and Islam geographically are Rome and Mecca respectively. Uh, and yet there's a lot of lip service paid to the Holy Land of Israel. So that was one discussion that Rabbi Yehuda Halevi had engaged in. Another was the fact that he, uh, he developed already earlier in the, the work this idea that the only uh, people who are capable of having a clear prophetic vision of God are the descendants of Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. And as such, the other nations are striving to have a clear vision of God, but they fall short. And therefore, both doctrinally and practically speaking, they don't really have the correct view of how to serve Hashem. And that was his way sort of, of polemicizing against the other faiths, because as we've discussed many times before, 
what uh, one of the objectives that he has in writing this book in the first place is to defend the despised faith of Judaism and to show that it really is uh, even more authentic than the other faiths. But that leads us to paragraph 12 of the fourth essay, which where he says, but people of other religions are closer to you than the philosophers. In other words, the two great challenges to Rabbi Yehuda Halevi's Jewish community at the time were the threat of, well, where he was living primarily Islam, but he also was living in Spain, which in the north of Spain, it wasn't that far across the Andalusian border to, uh, to, to Aragon and other Jewish communities in Christian Spain. So those were the two religious challenges that he had to contend with. Why aren't Jews either Muslim or Christian? Uh, especially since uh, they, they seem to be the most successful people of his time and the Jews are the downtrodden and the persecuted. But the even arguably even greater challenge is the members of the philosophical community of his time who were uh, mostly professed to be both Muslims and philosophers, but their philosophy took the front seat in many of the people of Rabbi Yehuda Halevi's milieu, there was a lot of philosophical speculation, even within a religious community. And this led Rabbi Yehuda Halevi to develop a decidedly negative attitude towards the study of philosophy and the whole project of philosophy. As we've discussed before, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi felt that there, were two, there are two incompatible projects there's the project of religion, which is to become close to Hashem. And there's the project of philosophy, which is, as the word philosophy implies, philosophia, a love of knowledge. Okay, a love of knowledge, the pursuit of knowing everything. And the more that you know, the more you have perfected yourself as a human being. And that's independent for at least Rabbi Huda Halevi's uh, uh, outlook, that's independent of developing a relationship with Hashem. And because the two projects are incompatible, he therefore felt that a Jew should not strive to integrate philosophical methodology into his Yiddishkeit. He was very much a purist and he felt, don't try to, um, to synthesize two pieces that don't really fit together well. This is very much unlike even more modern movements like Torah Umada, for example, which is right, what Yeshiva University, it, that's, their, that's their slogan, right? Or to, Torah and something else. As a purist, Rabbi Yehuda Levi believed that it's Torah, Nekuda as they say in Israel, period. Yeah. No, 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 no. He, he would never have written this book if he didn't believe in questioning. This book would have been one page long if he didn't believe in questioning. Absolutely, but philosophy qua philosophy in the sense that when we try to identify the philosophy of Rabbi Huda Levi's times, it was decidedly Aristotelian philosophy. There's, there's philosophy with a lowercase p, and there's philosophy with a capital P. The philosophy with the capital P that he's referring to is driven by one objective that Aristotle repeats many times in his writings, which is the whole function of humanity is to obtain ultimate knowledge and ah it could be but as you'll see in a moment he feels that that's not really this tantamount to closeness to god knowledge of god is fine but that's not really what hashem wants of us god is not asking us to know him even though there is a scripture in the prophets that says viadat et hashem you shall know Hashem, but his feeling is that closeness with God and knowledge of God are two completely different things. 
And that's really where it, this text is going. He says, I'm just going to read this one paragraph where he says, I agree that we are closer to people of faith than we are to philosophers. There is a great distance between the religious person and the philosopher. The religious person seeks God for lofty purposes other than for the purpose of knowing God. The philosopher, however, seeks only to depict God accurately in the same way that he seeks to depict the earth accurately. By saying, for example, that the earth is also in the center of the great sphere and not only in the center of the zodiac sphere. Now, this is a, this gets into um, astronomy in the medieval world, where the belief was that the earth was in the center of a series of concentric spheres. The closer sphere of these two spheres is the one that has all of the stars embedded within it, like a moving beach, transparent beach ball if you could imagine, with the earth in the center, okay, constantly moving. But then there's an even larger sphere that is even beyond the zodiac sphere that contains the stars. That's the great sphere that he calls. So it's important, let's say, if you're a philosopher slash scientist, because they really are the same term, then it's, it's just as important for you to know an accurate depiction of the cosmos and where the stars are and where all the spheres are, as it is for you to know God. And that is what Rabbi Yehud Halevi is critical of. God is not a scientific or philosophical pursuit, just as something that you would study so that you can know it. God is something that is a being that you seek out to be able to be mit dabek, to be attached, to attach yourself to, and to depict accurately all other types of knowledge. He believes that there is no greater harm in a mistaken understanding of God than in the mistaken belief that the earth is flat. Now, remember, this is being written in what year? What year did Rabbi Yehuda Levi write the Kuzari? The very beginning of the 12th century, long before Columbus sailed the ocean blue. So there were many people who already knew that the earth was not flat. These flat earthers today are really, really backward, I must say, right? It's uh, Oh my gosh, I can't believe that there's still such a movement, right? But even if you were an Aristotelian, back in the eighth century, you, you still knew that the, uh, or even before, you knew that the earth was round because everything that is perfect is spherical in nature or circular in nature. So they knew that even without scientific instrumentation. It was only like, I must have been some later conception outside of the philosophical community that believed that the earth was flat. Okay, but in any event, that's Rebbe Yehuda Halevi in a nutshell. Now, the reason why I want you to see that, and it's very important for you to know this, is because I'm going to now show you a, just a snippet of text from the Rambam, whose whole project was diametrically opposed to Rebbe Yehuda Halevi. Now, at no point does the Rambam ever cite Rebbe Yehuda Halevi in any of his writings. I have mentioned that in the past. Um, but that doesn't mean that he wasn't aware of the Kuzari. So a lot of scholars debate whether the Rambam had ever read the Kuzari. Uh, many scholars suggest that he had read it and that he was polemically responding to some of the statements of Rebbe Yehuda Halevi, because you got to remember the Rambam is writing his work at least 70 to 80 years after Rebbe Huda Halevi wrote his work. So it stands to reason that this Jewish philosophical community is not so huge. He probably did have access to what Rebbe Huda Halevi had to say. But one of the ways that uh, the Rambam would polemicize against people that he didn't agree with was by ignoring them <laughs> and not you know how sometimes people even do that today, talk to the hand, right? So that's some, that seems to be one of Reb, the Rambam's devices to be dismissive of an opinion that he doesn't agree with, not to quote it directly and then reject it, but simply to say, this is what we believe. And it's implicit that he's rejecting Rebbe Yehuda Halevi. So let me bring up that, um, that thing, uh, that the handout in the quote, from, uh, from, from the Rambam.
Um, and uh, let's see, the screen is now, should, should be up now. Okay, I hope you can see this. So we just quote at the beginning, the statement of Rebbe Yehuda Levi: the religious person seeks God for lofty purposes, other than for the purpose of knowing God. The philosopher, however, seeks only to depict God accurately in the same way that he seeks to depict the earth accurately. He believes that there is no greater harm in a mistaken understanding of God than in the mistaken belief that the earth is flat. The Rambam has an entire couple of chapters which absolutely reject that notion. The last thing, he believes that there is no greater harm in a mistaken understanding of God than in the mistaken belief that the earth is flat. I'm just going to read for you the text and then I want to discuss it very briefly. The Rambam writes, you must know that in examining the law, which means the Torah, and the books of the prophets, you will not find the expressions burning anger, provocation, or jealousy applied to God, except in reference to idolatry, and that none but the idolater is called the enemy, adversary, or hater of the Lord. In other words, God really, really has very strong language for his negative reaction to people who worship idols. There is, there is no greater negative depiction of the sinner in the Torah than the idolater. Now, the Rambam says this is directly related to our discussion of a knowledge of God. Instances like these are innumerable. He quotes a whole bunch of verses. And if you examine all the examples met with in the holy writings, you will find that they confirm our view. The prophets in their writings laid special stress on this because it concerns errors in reference to God. So that is, it concerns idolatry. In other words, any time a person has a mistaken belief about God, God says, that's wrong. I really despise that. For if, and he gives the following analogy. For if anyone believes that, for example, a man named Zaid is standing while in fact he is sitting, he does not deviate from truth so much as one who believes that fire is under the air or that water is under the earth or that the earth is a plane or things similar to these. You see that the earth is a plane, that the earth is flat. If you believe that somebody sitting, someone next to you is sitting instead of standing or vice versa, you're not making as egregious of a mistake in understanding as if you thought that the world was flat. Because thinking that the earth is flat is a more what he calls an egregious error. So fine, you make a mistake about a particular person, are they sitting or standing? No, no, there's no harm. Like, like what's the worst in, in the larger scheme of things? You have a mistaken notion about in a very localized situation about one person. Are they talking? They're not talking. They're sitting, they're standing. That's not so important. But what if you think the earth is flat? That's really bad, says the Rambam, or it's at least worse in the fact that you have corrupted knowledge in your mind, okay? Um, and then he goes on and he says, the latter does not deviate so much from truth as one who believes that the sun consists of fires or that the heavens form a hemisphere and similar things. In the third instance, the deviation from truth is less than the deviation of a man who believes that angels eat and drink and the like. So he's creating a hierarchy of mistaken thoughts that just like you, um, you could commit um, minor sins and major sins, okay? So let's say um, uh, ignoring a person at a kiddush because you just didn't see them, minor sin, okay? Not saying you don't have to do tshuva for it, but minor sin. You forgot to make a bracha or you made a bracha without kavana, minor issue, easily rectified. Eating a pig, big, right? <laughs> that's a big, that's, that's a major, major thing, right? And you can think of even more major crimes than that. Well, the same thing says the Rambam is true about putting religion aside. Let's think about ideas. People harbor mistaken ideas all the time but there are minor errors in knowledge and there are major errors in knowledge. And he has like a whole hierarchy, right? And he says, 
The latter again deviates. So if you think that angels are sitting up in heaven having meals, that's a more egregious error than thinking that the world is flat because you completely misunderstand the entire metaphysical realm. Okay, that's his contention. But the latter again deviates less from truth than one who believes that something besides God is to be worshiped. For ignorance and error concerning a great thing, that is a thing which has a high position in the universe, are of greater importance than those which refer to a thing which occupies a lower place. And by error, I mean the belief that a thing is different from what it really is. By ignorance, the want of knowledge respecting things, the knowledge of which can be obtained. So if you're ignorant, if you have a mistaken idea about things, that are lofty. So then you're committing a more egregious error than when you have a mistaken belief in things that are mundane, and less important or less celestial. If you have a mistaken belief about God and you think that God has a body or you think that God is more than one, right, which is what Brahman spends a lot of time on, then that's a more egregious error of knowledge than just thinking that Zaid is standing when he's really sit sitting, okay? Now, the infidels, however, though believing in the existence of the creator, attack the exclusive prerogative of God, namely the service and worship which was commanded, in order that the belief of the people in his existence should be firmly established. I'm going to skip that for just a minute. Okay. Um, okay. How great then, in other words, he's talking about how wrong idolatry is. And if idolatry is bad, because even if a person believes in God, but let's say attributes that there are other deities other than God as well, he says, that's really bad. But how great then must be the offense of him who has a wrong opinion of God himself and believes him to be different from what he truly is. That is, assumes that he either doesn't exist that he exists of two elements, that he is corporeal, that he is subject to external influence, or ascribes to him any defect whatsoever. Such a person is undoubtedly worse than he who worships idols in the belief that they as agents can do good or evil. If you have a mistaken belief about God, then you're even worse than an idolater. And if God really is angry at idolaters and really dislikes them, Imagine how much God must dislike a person who has a mistaken understanding of God. Compare, now let's go back to Rabbi Yehuda Halevi. So he says, and therefore the final is, therefore bear in mind that by the belief in the corporeality or in anything connected with corporeality, you would provoke God to jealousy and wrath, kindle his fire and anger, become his foe, his enemy, and his adversary in a higher degree than by the worship of idols. You're even worse than an idolater if you ascribe to God anything that he is not. So let me just go back to the sentence from Rabbi Yehuda Halevi. He said that the philosopher believes that there is no greater harm in a mistaken understanding of God than in the mistaken belief that the earth is flat. Isn't that uncanny that the Rambam seems to be directly addressing what Rabbi Yehuda Halevi says in this paragraph? without naming Rebbe Yehuda Halevi by name. So the Rambam's response to that sentence, what are you talking about? There's no greater harm. There is far greater harm in a mistaken belief of God than in a mistaken belief that the world is flat. Totally different. And if a person was granted an intellect by God, and misuses that intellect, especially in his understanding of Hashem, then that person is distant from God. For the Rambam, closeness to Hashem and knowledge of Hashem are one and the same. For Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, they are completely different species of things. And this is really a very, very sort of important distinction that starts that starts in the medieval world, as far as how we integrate or whether or not we should integrate philosophical methodology to the Torah. And that schism has only widened further and further in every succeeding generation. The, 
for the Rambam, for the Rambam of the Morine Vuchim, of the Guide for the Perplexed, it is perfectly consistent to be both a philosopher and a God-fearing Jew who wishes to be close to God. You can only become close to God by knowing God perfectly and knowing his universe, knowing his creation perfectly. And that's why you need to study science and botany and biology and anatomy and astrology and metaphysics and physics and all of that other stuff. For Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, closeness to Hashem is a pietistic effort through prayer, through repentance, through, um, through a righteousness and through a sincere desire to be close to Hashem. And it's a, it's a completely different objective. So am I, are you with me? Do you understand this divide? And it's, I think this divide is really important to try and understand. If, and I think that being either exclusively a Halavian or exclusively a Maimonidean is going to not be the place where you wanna be. And the reason is, is because to be completely rational in the way that the Rambam is, is not always going to enable you to pray with the type of kavana that we would, I think we would all want to be at. But also to be an anti-Maimonidean, like to be a Halavian, and to be completely removed from the world of science and philosophy, is also it also has its own pitfalls, and it becomes a religion that does not, is counterintellectual to a certain degree. I, I know that uh, Rachel, you had an issue. Well, I think I think for the Rambam, the Rambam does not see a distinction between the two. In another place in his writings, in his Mishneh Torah, he writes that when the Torah commands me to love God, how do how can you how can I command an emotion? I can't tell you, love your children, love your husband. You either do or you don't, right? And if you don't, you got issues, right? But I can't tell you you're obligated to love somebody that you don't love. How can you be obligated to love Hashem? The Rambam's answer is that when you start thinking about God and you start thinking about everything that he does and everything that he does for you specifically, you fall in love with God. And so... His understanding of knowledge of God is that knowledge brings to that what you're describing as a spiritual devotional experience because one feeds into the other, okay? But it does start with the intellect for the Rambam. To have, to be in love, I don't know how Mrs. Rambam felt about his whole theology. I'm not really sure. I never spoke to her, never, never got any correspondence from her. But I wonder if the relationship between the Rambam and his wife was based on an intellectual appreciation of who his wife was and how much she did for him. But certainly he took that kind of approach. It was a, it's a very rationalistic approach. Oh, so, you know, we're all opening up a whole can of worms over here. Um, do you believe in love at first sight? Do you believe in an irrational kind of love? Look, I, I, there's a story about one of my Russia yeshiva that when he married his wife, he had l developed a whole list of questions to see how to test her wisdom. And when I heard that, I said, oh, I mean, I think that's admirable if you're going on a shidduch date and someone setting you up, you want to you want to see is this going to be my intellectual uh, intellectually compatible as this person, right? But I didn't meet my wife that way. Uh, we met when we were 16 years old, and we had a crush on each other, and that's how love grew in our lives. I don't know. That's the reason why, as much as I appreciate where the Rambam is coming from, I have a hard time being exclusively my monadian in my outlook. The human condition is complicated. With a lot of the things that we do, we do in, with our minds rationally. 
And a lot of things that we do um, transcend the rational. And Rabbi Huda Halevi is completely transcendent. The Rambam is completely rational. And I think we have to sort of hold on to a little bit of both. Yeah. That is correct. But, um, I would say, like nowadays, like as the century has progressed, and people became more knowledgeable in, in the world, and the content that before, it's almost like it made you, it had to push you in the direction of, of my martyrs and the more because did people not just automatically think of things, you know, like things appeared in nature and understanding of science and people try to correlate the two with what they believe. So we didn't know about all the science and discoveries that were happening, even about the world and astronomy and creation, whatever. Um, you know, you start to think about that. How does this relate to scientific discoveries? Is my innate belief totally, you know, faith-based or do, should I try to incorporate my understanding of what the new discoveries in the world are yeah. with my... Sure, so, sure. And you, and you, the, the debate still continues to this day which is why you'll have people who say, I need to shield my children from everything, even scientific discovery. Although that, that population is becoming smaller and smaller, I think, because I think even in the Haredi world, people are realizing that you can look at the universe and discover amazing things. The more that we learn about scientific reality, the more you have the ability at least, not, not that you're forced to conclude that, but you certainly have the ability to find God in creation. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's what we're, that's how we're going to end our discussion today. I think we spent enough time on this. Um, and what I'd like to do is now launch into something in our Parsha, actually not in our Parsha, but in our Haftorah for this Shabbos. This Shabbos is the last Shabbos of the year. Um, and it is also um, the last Haftorah of a series of seven. There are seven Haftorahs. Let me just see, there's someone who has put in a comment. Um, there are people that say that they have challenges with living with, living with God as they can't see him. I think that's a, I think that's a valid point. But I think that um, there are many things that you can find in the world that certainly, especially in scientific inquiry, that certainly points to, let's say, what we would call a, um, what's the word I'm looking for, a, a, tele a teleology, which is sort of like a, an intelligence, an intelligent design, an intelligence that guides the, both the formation and the structure of the world. There was once a fellow who's since been like blacklisted on the web who said that you would need 20 different criteria to satisfy life on a planet. And it's a so extremely, extremely unlikely from a statistical point of view to be able to have 20 of those criteria met on just one planet. And that's why he's of the belief that there probably is not life on other planets. And since his initial list of 20, I think the list has grown to about 400, right? Of things that you would need to satisfy in order to even to, for life to even begin. And that's just life. Now let's talk about sentient life, which is a whole bigger, like if man is an ev a, a creature that's just a product of random evolution, why is self-awareness an important component of the evolutionary process? Um, doesn't, you know, all, all you need for evolution to succeed is to be able to survive and to be able to thrive uh, as, a, as a living being, to know how to hunt, to know how to gather, to know how to uh, fend for yourself. Why do you need to be able to evolve into a being of self-awareness and sentience, what we call intelli human intelligence? And now we're evolving even further. Like, why is that evolution something that's necessary? So in any event, um, we're not here to prove the existence of God, but I guess the point being is that um, 
There are many people like the Rambam who feel that looking into the world helps engender a greater understanding of Hashem, or at least what he wants us to understand about him. Okay, so let us go on. Here's a, a verse from our Haftorah. Um, it is from the very beginning of chapter 63 of Isaiah. And as I mentioned, this is the last in a series of seven Haftorahs that are known as the Shev de Nechemta, the seven Haftorahs of consolation. What are we being consoled for? For the destruction of the temples that happened on Tisha B'av. So right after Tisha B'av, we had Shabbos Nachamu, but that was seven weeks ago. So every Shabbos since Shabbos Nachamu, we've had a special Haftorah that offers consolation in the form of don't worry, I will avenge your humiliation and I will rebuild and I will bring you back to the promised land. There, there, there will be a messianic age, essentially. Here in this text, we see an extremely vivid description of God not rebuilding, but of God taking vengeance upon the enemies of the Jews who have oppressed us throughout our diaspora history. And so, Mize Bame Edom, Edom, Chamutz Bigadim Mibotsra. Who is this coming from Edom in crimsoned garments from Botsra? Who is this majestic in attire, pressing forward in his great might? Who is that person? So, as the Mitsudas David points out, Hanavi Hit Nabe, Featid Hakadosh Baruchu La Asot Nikama Biseir. The prophet is basically saying that he will eventually take vengeance upon Seir. And the prophet is speaking in the vernacular, the way you would speak in when you're having a conversation. People that are wearing clothes. When you kill somebody violently on the battlefield, you will have a splattering of blood of your victim on your clothing. And that's why the prophet says, who is this, this being that I have in my vision? Coming from Edom, splattered, his clothing splattered in blood. Um, okay, why is your clothing so red? Your garments like his who treads grapes? I trampled the winepress alone. Of the other nations, no man was, myth, was with me. I trod them down in my anger, trampled them in my rage. Their lifeblood bespattered my garments and all my clothing was stained. For I had planned a day of vengeance and my year of redemption arrived. Okay. Now, this is what the Haftorah says. And the question really is, does this really speak to us? Is this supposed to be a consolation to the Jewish people? Don't worry, Jewish people, even though you've suffered great death and destruction and humiliation at the hands of your oppressors, don't worry. God is going to be so vengeful against the other nations that his clothing, so to speak, will be splattered with blood from all of the carnage against the other nations, okay? What does that even mean? Is that supposed to be a consolation? I think for people, let's say, maybe who survived the Shoah, to say that, uh, you know, there are uh, like TV shows today, which, you know, there was a movie called Inglorious uh, Bastards that was done by Tarantino, right? That there's a certain sort of um, violent thrill that people get from seeing Nazis being, being beheaded and, and uh, you know, gore and guts and violence. But that's not, is that really a high level type of consolation? Is that what we should be striving for to be part of a, what's, this, what's his first name, Tarantino? Um, uh, Quen, Quentin, should, is, this, is that our goal to be, to be watching a Quentin Tarantino mo movie about the enemies of the Jews? Is that our ultimate consolation? Is that really what we want? I mean, I think that those kinds of gore really appeal to a baser instinct within man and don't really appeal to the higher level of humanity that is within us. Would you agree? 
So that's the thing that bothers me about this text. Okay. Yeah, but it, it is full of violence, and you could su possibly suggest that yes, man, man in his baser state, perhaps in the ancient world, this is how he found uh, consolation through vengeance. Um, and but the thing I think that's that brings this to a new level is the fact that. God is being described in such anthropomorphic terms of being like a warrior who's splattered with blood, you know? Okay, so that's the part that bothers me. Let's take a look at another part that I think is a little bit bothersome. Amar Reish Lakish. Reish Lakish says, this is from Tractate Makot. Shalosh ta'uyot atid saro shalromi litot. So first of all, the Gemara clarifies that this is not God taking vengeance upon human beings, mortal beings. But rather, if you noticed in the Haftorah, um, there was only, um, there's only one victim. Uh, at least that's the way the Gemara is portraying it. Not that I killed a whole population of people, but rather it is the Sar Shel Romi. And like Rashi says, the, the Sar, the archangel of Rome, is Samael, which is another word for Satan. Okay, so Dichtiv, as it says, Mize ba me Adom chamutz begadim mi batsra. So there are three errors that the angelic sort of guardian of Rome will make when God seeks to uh, smite the angel of Rome. And really, all of this is therefore a metaphor in the Talmud's eyes of the falling of the Roman, the Holy Roman Empire, um, which was the dominant force and which, according to tradition, continues even to this day in Western civilization. Okay, so just a continuation of Rome. And when God will, will cause Rome to fall, it is described as the execution of the archangel of Rome. And so it's all metaphorical. That's the splattering of blood. It's the splattering of the blood of the angel, so to speak. And even though angels don't have blood, it's a very vivid description of God sort of completely annihilating the archangel of Rome. So what three mistakes is the angel going to make? So first of all, the angel is going to make an initial mistake because if you notice, the Haftorah text had said, Mize bame edom chamutz begadim mi botsra. Where is this place called Botsra? It's not really clear where Botsra is, but it's probably part of the Roman Empire. And so the mistake that the angel is making is he's going to confuse the city of Betzer with the city of Botsra. What's the difference? Just the letter He. What is Betzer? Betzer is one of the six cities of refuge that the Torah identifies in Parshat Matot Masse. It's, it says that there are six cities of refuge. At Betzer Bamidbar, it's on, the, it's on the Transjordan, is one of the first, it's the first city of refuge, the Ir Miklat, that is identified by the Torah. So the angel's going to make an error and is going to think that Botsra and Betzer are the same place. So as long as the angel flees to Botsra, he'll be immune to the attack. That's mistake number one. To'eh she'ina koletet elashogeg v'hu mezid haya. Second mistake is that the angel who is fleeing God will think that if you flee to a city of refuge, it'll protect you, even if you are an intentional murderer. Even if you commit first degree homicide, you will be protected. And in reality, a city of refuge only protects those who murder by accident, but don't murder on purpose. So that's the second mistake, is that this angel of Rome, Rome was ruthless in attacking and killing Jews. And they did, it's not, you can't say that they killed us by accident, they killed us on purpose. And therefore the angel will not be protected by either Betzer or Batzra. And then the third mistake that the angel is going to make, third mistake is that a city of refuge only protects mortal beings. 
it doesn't protect angels. And therefore, that is why, despite the fact that this angel is fleeing to Batsra, it will not be protected, says the prophet Isaiah, and God, God will smite the angel. That's why his garment will be splattered in blood. And that is the whole metaphor of the fall of the Roman Empire. Okay? That's the way the Gemara understands it. I think it's a little bit light, lighter on us. Maybe we're not weighed down so heavily now by this imagery, but we're still left with a huge mystery, which is what in the world is the Talmud talking about? The angel's gonna make three mistakes. It's gonna think that it can seek sanctuary in a city of refuge. It's gonna be confused about the name of the city. It's gonna be confused about in, intentional versus accidental. It's gonna be confused between whether you're a human or whether you're an angel. I mean, what in the world is the message that we're supposed to draw from all of this? What is the Talmud trying to communicate about what the phenomenon of the fall of the Satan is all about? This is such a powerful image that it, for certain groups of Jews, it is the climax of Shalashudas, of Sudash Lishit. We don't do this in our shul, but in Hasidic shuls, in the shtibl, if you go to Shalashudas, which you probably never will do, because they usually don't have Shalashudas for women in the shtibl, but there is this very powerful song, the Zemer, that was composed in the 11th century or the late 10th, either late 10th or, or early 11th century by Rabbi Shimon Hagadol, who was one of the uh, Paitanim, was one of the poets of the time. And he takes this imagery and put it into a, po a poem called Bevo Me Edom Chamutz Begadim. And it has a whole niggin. If you want to go on YouTube, the niggin from, there's a, a, people sing this niggin and there's actually, I found a video of someone singing the niggin of Sigit. The Sigit niggin of Bevo Me Edom. And that's the one that I know also, more or less. Bevo Me Edom, Chamutz, Begodim, Zevach Lo Bevatsra, Bitevach Lo Bevo Yeah, you know that? You know the niggin? Really? Okay, so this is, so, yeah, so look, so look it up on, on YouTube and maybe uh, it'll bring back some memories. Okay, so, and then at the end of the poem or right sort of towards the end of the poem, it's supposed to be such an inspiring moment at the end of Shabbos when we think about how God will annihilate the Satan that everyone stands up and the Rebbe says, Hashem Eilech, Hashem Olach, Hashem Yimloch, Lo'ilam Ba'ed. And then he will say in some circles, he'll say, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeini, Hashem Echot. That's supposed to be the climax of the entire Shabbos, is the recitation of this poem. So there's got to be something powerful here that we're not picking up on, because it's, it talks about the three errors that will be made by the Satan. And so I'm just going to leave you with this idea. And hopefully it'll be something that you can carry with you into the Yom Im Tovim as well, because as you'll see, it does connect with something that we do on Rosh Hashanah. The, um, the role of the Satan in our lives is to obscure and to make things unclear and blurry in our lives. So a lot of times people are able to rationalize bad behavior by saying, ah, it wasn't so bad what I did. They'll forgive me. Why should I worry about it? It was only a bracha or it was only a mincha or it was this or it was that. And what's, what's the big deal? And mankind has the tendency to take off his spectacles when doing self-examination. And the danger of that is, is that if you have, God forbid, some kind of growth on your body and you don't examine it carefully, it could get worse and worse. The name of the angel that Rashi says is the angel of Rome is Samael. 
So you notice that Rashi says, Saro shel Romi Samael. Why is he called Samael in Kabbalistic literature? So as the Tal- as the Midrash says, Shemisame et ha'enayim. What is the word for blind in, the, in Aramaic? Suma. Lesame is to blind somebody. Lesame et ha'enayim means to blind the eyes. The role of the Satan, the role of the archangel of Rome, the, the sort of the, the, the negative influence of the external society is to cause man to not carefully be aware of what he or she is doing, to not really be introspective sufficiently, to sort of lift our gaze from what is important in life. And we do that all the time, and probably more so in the 21st century than ever before. Because as soon as we start to maybe perhaps pry a little bit into the meaning of our lives and to why we're doing these things, all of a sudden the phone rings and then we pick it up and we start looking at our texts and, uh, and then we start to thinking about this meme and that meme and start to da, 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 and we get so distracted. And life is filled with distractions. And according to the Talmud, these distractions are, are personified as Samael sort of doing his job. So when Hashem splatters his garments with the blood of Samael, it really means that mankind will now be able to focus once again on the important things in life and see things with greater clarity than he has ever seen before. And that's the reason why this song is so important because by the end of Shabbos, we are supposed to have obtained a clarity of vision that we haven't been able to attain for the entire week. We've entered into that spiritual zone. We've been divested of all of the distractions of the mundane week. Can't even pick up our phones, can't smoke a cigarette, can't do anything that perhaps even in earlier generations would be distracting. No work, no this, no that. All I can focus on is the meaning of my existence and connecting with my maker. And that's why this song, the destruction of Samael is such an impactful song. Now, why does it, why therefore, how does this explain the Talmudic passage? What the Talmud is simply saying is that God plays the same game with Samael as Samael plays with us. Samael is so used to making things blurry and distracting for mankind that he also sees things blurrily and gets very distracted. And that's what happens when you see things blurrily and are distracted as you make mistakes. So just like Samael causes us to make mistakes, Samael is depicted as making mistakes of sloppy behavior and sloppy vision. And that's why he'll confuse Betzer for Batzra. He'll think that it's even if you're an intentional murderer, you can go to an ear miklat. And he'll think that an ear miklat works for angels when it only works for human beings. That's the message, I think, that the Gemara is trying to convey. And I also believe that that's why, you know, this is a message that we should take with us for Rosh Hashanah. Rabbi Yitzchak said, Lama tok in Rosh Hashanah. Why do we blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah? So the Gemara says, what do you mean, why do we blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah? The Torah tells us to blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah. Ela, Lama tokinu marin kishahin yoshvin, the tokinu marin kishahin omdin. Rather, the, really, the, really, my question is, why do we have to blow twice? Once before Musaf and once during Musaf. And the Gemara's answer is, Kedei la'arvev ha-satan, to confuse or to confound the Satan. One of the popular questions is, Satan's been at this game for a long time. He knows when Rosh Hashanah is, it's the first of Tishrei comes out the same way every year. He knows that they've been blowing shofar twice for, for millennia. Like, why is that a source of confusion for the Satan? I just want you to think that the idea of confounding or confusing the Sutton is a much more profound idea. When we do things with clarity, then the Sutton's own efforts are thrown back into its face. And the more clarity that we have, the more confusion that the Sutton tried to present us with is thrown back right at him. And his own confusing game is what he gets caught into. That's just the beginning of the conversation and the rest is commentary, but we're out of time. 
So let me just see if there's any, we need to know God is a God of justice, this kind of revenge fantasy. Um, let's see, uh, helps us to understand this. Okay. From when you were yeah. talking about like inglorious. Yes, right. Right, so you've, the revenge fantasy helps us that to, that God is a God of justice. Okay, that's and certainly- enough. Think, we need to hear it once in a while that God is going to take revenge on our, our enemies because we need to know that all the suffering that we've gone through is, you know, will be paid back because he's a God of deen. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Okay, have a good week, everybody. We'll see you all soon. Thank you, thank you.